So I want to start this video off by just telling you that I have no problems with Jesus himself. I have no problems with his teachings. As you can see in these videos, I use his teachings to explain regularly on this channel. But with that said, I do want to show what the writers in the Gospels do to prop up Jesus with the claim that he is the prophesied Messiah. And what they do is they use fake fulfillments that I'm going to show you in this video that will take scriptures and they will take them out of context and make it look as if they are fulfillments that Jesus fulfilled in these scriptures. They actually do this about 15 to 17 times depending on how you look at a couple of those. And the best way to describe this is a parable that I heard from a rabbi. The parable goes like this. There was a man that lived in a kingdom and he wandered all throughout the kingdom. And every time he wandered throughout this kingdom, he would see trees and he would see bullseyes. And he kept wandering around this kingdom and he kept seeing all these targets with arrows directly on these bullseyes. So as he continued around the kingdom, he became enamored with seeing more and more trees with arrows right on the bullseye. So he began to search out and find the actual archer who was doing this because he said, I cannot believe how accurate that this archer is. So all of a sudden, after much searching, he came and found the archer. And he said, how in the world are you shooting arrows that accurately? You are getting bullseyes every single time. And the archer came down to the child and he said, let me tell you a secret, son. This is what I really do. I shoot the arrow into the tree first, and then I paint the target around the arrow. It is an illusion, my son. And this is the illusion that is being given in these Gospels. This does not take away any credence to what may be taught in the parables and his accurate teaching of the principles of the Torah that you'll find in these Gospels, but it is very important to realize what is being shown in these Gospels because without these supposed prophecies it would give no credibility to Jesus being the supposed Messiah. And this is all part of what I always say that the New Testament is all about. It's all about testing your knowledge of the Scriptures to see if you really understand the Scriptures and to see if you will really seek after Yehovah with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. With that said, I'm going to give you three examples of this in the book of Matthew in the first two chapters of supposed fulfillments and fake prophecies that I will show you with the scriptures so you can see for yourself. The first prophecy you're going to see is that of the virgin birth. And this is a very popular one amongst Christians because it is something that is so profound that a man would be born of a virgin. Wow, what a big miracle, right? So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 through 23, and you will see that the prophecy is being spoken of here that he will be born of a virgin, that they will call his name Emmanuel. Now we're going to start off by understanding that they are quoting from Isaiah chapter 7. And you have to understand the context of Isaiah chapter 7 through 10 as a whole and what the story is about. Now, one of the things you also want to understand is that Isaiah's three children spoken of in these chapters, chapter 7 through 10, are used by God as signs to the people at the time. You'll see Isaiah's first son being spoken of in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 3. Take a look. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shirjashub thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Shirjashub just means a remnant will return, and you'll understand this in the future, that there will be a righteous remnant that will return, and this was supposed to bring comfort to the people at the time, to let the people know, hey, there will be a righteous remnant that will come back to the land. Rest assured it will happen. So this is Isaiah's first child. The second child is what we will see here is being named Emmanuel. And you'll see that in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, that the woman bears a son and his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And we'll see why this is in a second. And the third child you'll actually see, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce this name, but I'm going to show you the verse. Look at Isaiah chapter 8 and look at verse 3. You'll see here that Isaiah's wife is to bear a child and they name him as such. Okay, so now we have three children of Isaiah being shown here in the scriptures. God tells us in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18, that God uses Isaiah's three children to be signs to the people at the times. Look at verse 18. This is important. Behold, I and the children whom Jehovah hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from Jehovah of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. 
also you'll understand not only were his children signs, but he himself was also assigned to the people. As you can see in Isaiah chapter 20, that he actually ran naked through the city to be assigned to the people. Take a look. At the same time spake Jehovah by Isaiah the son of Amos, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from thy loins, and put off thy shoe from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. And Jehovah said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years as a sign and a wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptian prisoners and the Ethiopian captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. Okay, so now let's see, what is the sign Emmanuel? Why is Isaiah's child his second child, to be exact, being given as a sign at this time. What is going on? And this is where it comes into play that you have to understand the context being given in this chapter 7 through 10. What we have to understand is that this word being used in Isaiah chapter 7 through 14, called Ha'alma in Hebrew, is being translated in many translations as virgin. The problem is, is that word is never used in Hebrew as virgin. It is always used as young maiden. And I'll show you this on the screen here. Many translations today have corrected this problem and made the change. But to the reader who doesn't understand Hebrew, he will see this and he will say, oh wow, a virgin, she conceives, she bears a child, see? And you can overcome this if you know the context being given at this time, even if you don't understand what Alma means in Hebrew. And we know that this woman is not a virgin anyways because the first child being spoken of by Isaiah's wife is spoken of in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 2 being Shirjashim, which means a remnant shall return. So this woman is not a virgin. She's already bore a child. But what is this child being assigned for? Emmanuel means God is with us. As you'll see in Isaiah chapter 10, you'll see that the people are being given this child to be a sign that God is with us. But why do they need this sign? And this is where proper context comes into play. If you just use one verse, it's very easy to take a verse like this and make it look like something that it is not. This is why proper context is so important. The chapters 7 through 10 are all telling the same story. And what is happening is two kingdoms, Assyria and the northern tribes of Israel, known as Ephraim, these two kings and these two kingdoms are planning to come against the southern kingdom of Judah and take it. They have made a confederacy together to come against King Ahaz in Judah. So King Ahaz, who had been veering away from God's laws and commandments, is very afraid. He was afraid that his kingdom was going to be taken over. So Isaiah says, hey, I'm going to give you a sign. Ask a sign. So Ahaz stands up and says, no, I'm not going to ask a sign. I'm not going to tempt Jehovah. I've been sinful. And so Isaiah says, hey, look, if you won't ask, I'm going to give you a sign. And what he does is he says, look, don't worry. The kingdoms that are coming against you, they're not going to win. They're not going to prosper. Why? Because God says that the kingdom of Judea, the southern kingdom, will be protected for his servant David's sake. So he says, hey, here's the sign to you. The child, the woman, will give birth to a son. My wife, the prophetess, she will give birth to a son named Emmanuel, which means God is with us. This child will be a sign to the people and to you, King Ahaz, that God is with us. You need not worry. These two kingdoms, before the child can even know to decipher between right and wrong, before this child can even do that, these two kingdoms that are planning to plot against you shall be gone. They'll be taken over. So this is the proper context of the child named Emmanuel in Isaiah chapter 7. Also, I would add that if Jesus is born of a virgin, as I mentioned in another video, then he is not of the lineage of David. The Messiah is supposed to come from David's physical loins, as you'll see in 2 Samuel chapter 7. It doesn't work if he is born of a virgin anyway. So the first prophecy that you see that is false in Matthew chapter 1 disproves the idea that he can be the Messiah anyways, at least the Messiah that is prophesied in the Hebrew Scriptures to do the things that were spoken of. You see, it is the seed that determines the fruit. It is not the soil which it is planted in. So if he is not coming from David's loins, then he does not qualify. Number two, out of Egypt have I called my son. If you take a look at Matthew chapter two, you'll see another supposed prophecy that is being used out of context. Look at verse 13 and 14. What you'll see is the idea that Herod is trying to kill Jesus, the child, and that to flee away from Herod and killing the child, they flee out of Egypt. And then it says that it might be fulfilled by the prophet, out of Egypt have I called my son. But 
Where is this coming from? We have to look at this just as we spoke of about the supposed virgin birth. We have to look at it in proper context. And if you know the scriptures, if you know the prophets, you will see that this is errant. Look at Hosea chapter 11 verses 1 through 4. And the whole theme of Hosea is about the wayward northern kingdom of Ephraim, the ten tribes that always went after idols. So if you'll see here as I post this on the screen, you'll see that Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 through 4, you'll see that what is really happening is God is saying, look, I called my son Israel out of Egypt and even though I loved him and I called him my son, they went after other idols. They went after other gods. So this is really an idea of a prodigal son that they went wayward from their father and they went after other gods. Not anything that has to do with a prophecy of the king of Israel or Jesus himself at all. This is another example of taking something out of context or just as the parable that was given in the beginning of this video that they shot an arrow at a tree then painted the target around it. The only actual time that the king of Israel is prophesied or spoken of in the book of Hosea is in chapter 3. And lastly, number three, another example is at the end of Matthew chapter 2, you'll see that there is a prophecy being given that he shall be called a Nazarene out of the town of Nazareth. There's actually two things wrong with this. One. At the time of Jesus' birth, for what it's worth, there was no town called Nazareth, if you want to do the research on that, but that's not even the big deal on this part. The problem is, is that to be called a Nazarite does not have anything to do with even being from a town called Nazareth. It has to do with keeping the vows being spoken of in Numbers chapter 6 to abstain from strong drink, liquor, wine, and dead bodies. Also, the other problem with this is that there is no such prophecy about the future king of Israel that will be a Nazarite, even with the actual true methods of being a Nazarite at all, being found in Numbers chapter 6. What they are doing is quoting from Judges chapter 13 when it is speaking of the child called Samson who would become a Nazarene that would deliver the Israelites from the hand of the Philistines. The problem is, is this is not any type of dual prophecy or anything of that nature that people will claim. This is another example of ripping this out of context and then painting the target around the image after they have placed the arrow already. So again, these are the three examples. There's 17 of them just in the book of Matthew. You can look at many, many others, but uh, today I'm just sticking with these three just to at least try to get you to see what is going on. And during this time, it's going to be very important to see these types of things because our eyes have to be opened. And even though Jesus actually taught from the Torah, from the prophets, and the principles that were in there, as I always use, as you'll see as a testimony in this video, I just want people to see this because they have to be able to give up the idea of him being their Messiah or their Savior because it is God, it is Jehovah who is our Savior and there is none else. This is what this day is about. So I'm just hoping that showing you this will actually help you in this process of coming back to God. So I thank you again for watching and I'll see you again on another video. Let there be